Hello everyone, this is our last look at Bible translations, and we're going to look at Bibles that were that published from 2000 to the present. And this diagram just shows you a map from the organization called the Joshua Project, and they map out and show information about unreached people groups and how you can pray and get involved. And, and on their website, you can see if they have the Bible in their language or not. So you can see here in the red of people that are still unreached with the gospel today. Okay, I've used several of these kind of diagrams, and I found this one to be really uh, helpful to show the, the spectrum from word for word, thought for thought, into a paraphrase in the different versions of where they line up. But it also, this diagram shows you different uh, information about whether there's gender neutral language or if they have the Apocrypha in this language or not, and whether it was the Texas Receptus or the Alexandrian based text. So, a lot of different information shown on this graph. So, check that out. So the first one we'll look at is the English Standard Version that came out in 2001. And they use the basis of the Revised Standard Version, uh, the 7, 1971 edition. Remember, so many of our Bibles start with a uh, previous basis and then compare the Greek and he Hebrew manuscripts. And this is an essentially literal or a word-for-word -word translation. And they wanted to capture the overtones and meanings that are abundant in the original text. In the text they use, they use the Masoretic text of the Hebrew Bible, um, the Old Testament. The, the United Bible Society or the Nestle Allen 28th edition of the Greek New Testament. And they consulted the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Septuagint, the Pentateuch, uh, the Syriac Peshitta we looked at earlier, and the Latin Vulgate. So really um, making use of all the, the available manuscripts that are uh, present today. Um, there was a 100 plus publishing and translating team from different denominations. One of the things that they did replace uh, anyone uh, replaced the man whenever it was referring to like mankind or a plural of people. Uh, people replaced men when it was plural and it reflect w whenever they were talking about men and women, they weren't really trying to diminish the gender differences. So I don't believe there's an agenda here in gender equality or gender egality rather. Okay, the Holman Christian Standard Bible in 2004, uh, using uh, the 27th edition of the Nestle Allen text and and uh, the fifth edition of, of that uh, Masoretic uh, Old Testament, and it's an optimal equivalence. It's a kind of a blend of a phrase for phrase and a, a word for word, and I really like this one. Uh, since I one of the, since I taught this class last, I have a copy of this now, and I really like it. it you can kind of tell if you know what Greek word is used in a place when they've shifted for phrase for phrase versus a word for word. Um, so when the clarity and readability demand the idiomatic translation, uh, the reader can still access that original text by looking at the footnote and it'll tell you the literal word instead of the phrase. Found that to be useful. So uh, it avoids using man or he unnecessarily and the translation does not uh, does not restructure the sentence to avoid them when they're in the text. So they've not changed the gender words uh, uh, for a more egalitarian view. Um, they don't avoid masculine use of father or, or son by translating them in generic terms as parent or child. Uh, and there was, again, a translation team of over 100 Bible scholars. And you can see the co comparison of the HCSB. Uh, one of they use one of the key things they did with the names of God, like when it was the original Hebrew was Elohim, it's God. Uh, whenever it's Yahweh, it's capital L-O-R-D. Adonai is lowercase L-O-R-D. And you have Adonai Yahweh with lower Lord and all caps God and so on. So different ways to show the different names of God in the text. The NET, the New English Translation, was published in 2005. And it was designed to be a digital Bible, an all online uh, Bible that could be free and used by everyone. It's got 60,932 translator notes. Uh, and when you download the app, you'll see about every other word has a, a little icon you can click on and see the translator notes. And it'll give you the rationale of why they chose to render that particular text the way they did. Um, a friend uh, described it as kind of like a, a Greek nerd study Bible. They used 25 plus scholars from different backgrounds, and it was commissioned to have a, a Bible translation that could be placed on the internet, downloaded for free, and circulated around the world. And they, they allowed the Gideon organization and Wycliffe Bible Translation to use it for free to get 
into places uh, that have not been reached and are needed in their language. Uh, it's a totally new translation, so the key thing is it did not use a previous translation as their basis. It's just a fresh, they use the, all the manuscripts, um, the 27th edition of the Nestle Allen text, and uh, the Masoretic text of the, of the Hebrew Old Testament, and comparing the Septuagint to just translate a fresh version. And you can see the di the picture, it's kind of hard to see, but if you, they did, there is uh, hard copies, they're hard to find, but they're just so uh, multi-volume or large uh, books because of all the extra translator notes that have to be published in the, in the page. The TNIV is, is supposed to be a more balance of dynamic equivalence and formal equivalence. And they will use saints, uh, will be translated as God's people, and they do in, introduce gender neutral language. So uh, God created human beings in his own image, not man. And there's a shift uh, in the English creates a greater challenge for modern translators, and they move away from the use of the third person masculine pronouns of he, him, and his to refer to men and women equally. So they, there is a push for an egalitarian um, view of men and women in, in reference to the text. Here you can see um, a comparison of each of the versions where they have father is replaced by parents and son is replaced by children. In Acts, uh, men is replaced with some. And then in Hebrews, you have father and parents and children and sons replaced. And then and the same thing in Acts 20. So lots of replacing of masculine pronouns with plural or, or nondescriptive pronouns. So now the, the message, and I'll admit, I, when the message first was published and I read it and heard people quote it, I was very against it. But when you realize, though, it's just a paraphrase that a guy, Eugene Peterson, he just was putting it on, in his own words to, and wasn't intending it to be a study Bible that uh, as such, or a new translation, he just wanted to get it, the Bible in a language that his congregation could understand. And so he would end up, um, trans, he would end up paraphrasing the text. And he was a Greek and Hebrew scholar, and so he would study and then unpack the meaning as they studied. And so people really liked it. And there was a publishing company that con contacted him and wanted him to publish uh, a Bible in the language the way he was doing it for his congregation. So when you know that and you read it uh, with that, not thinking it's, you know, equal or different or the serves the same function as a King James Bible, and you, uh, it makes the, it made my attitude and view of it different. Next is the Lexham English Bible that came out in 2011, and it's a formal equivalent or word for word. And they use the SBL uh, Greek New Testament, which is a blend pretty much of the Westcott and Hort, the Tregellus, uh, and the, the New Testament that the NIV is based on. And it's, a, it's designed, it was kind of taken from an interlinear Bible, which is you know, uh, a Bible where you have one Greek word and side by side is its English translation. Uh, most of the time you can just find these in like a digital, co digital app where you can compare uh, and so they took that interlinear Bible and these manuscripts and, and translated. It was designed to be used alongside uh, the original language of the text of the Bible. And I like this diagram up here. You can see the intelligibility uh, on the Y and its accuracy on, on the X. And the, the thing I like about this is the colors that it shows you kind of a purpose that if you're wanting a study translation in the blue, things to read for devotional in the red and then just supplemental things that are of help in the green and so you have the leb the Alexum english bible to the far right um, in the spectrum next is the tree of life version that was published in 2014 and it's designed to be a messianic jew translation the, uh, the idea of the new testament uh being translated in view of a Jew that has become a Christian, and so that, that Jesus fulfilled the covenant. And so the, it's refer, it refers to like the Old Testament as the Tanakh, and then the New Testament as the New Covenant. And it's uh, the preface described as a very Jewish friendly voice and hold to true to the Hebrew roots of the Christian faith. It is a word for word translation, and it used the, the Masoretic Old Testament uh, text and the 27th edition of the Nestle Allen text. Um, also in the preface, it described that, uh, one, the Jewish order of the books of the Old Testament, 
the Jewish names of Messiah, Yeshua, and the reverence for the four-letter unspoken name of God, um, which we won't say, uh, Hebrew transliterated terms such as Shalom, Shafar, and Shavat that are used uh, to reflect the Jewish heritage of the writings. The MEV, the Modern English Version, published in 2014, um, there's a committee on the Bible translation organized by a guy named James Lindsay, and he used the, the Jacob ben Hayim Masoretic text and the Texas Receptus. And they used the King James as a reference and then had a formal word-for-word -word translation. So this is a good, a different shift in the stream of which manuscripts were used. They did not use the, the uh, Nestle Allen text, but rather they used the Texas Receptus. So this is a Bible that really, if you want to look for something that is in the stream of King James, and so it's pretty much translated from the same manuscripts that the King James was translated from only a few years later. The Passion Translation in 2015 was kind of chaired by a Dr. Brian Simmons, and he described that the purpose of the Passion Translation is to reintroduce the passion fire of the Bible to the English reader. It doesn't merely convey the literal meaning of words. It expresses God's passion for people and his word, world by translating the original life-changing message of God's word for modern readers. They, they call it a essential equivalence or a essential form and essential function of the original words or a, instead of a word for word or a thought for thought, a meaning for meaning translation. And they use the uh, 1977 edition of the Masoretic uh, uh, Biblia Hebraica text of the Old Testament and the 27th edition of the Nestle Island text, but they also consult the Syriac Peshitta as as well. So uh, interesting, interesting translation in philosophy. The CSB, the Christian Standard Bible, 2017, is a revision of the HCSB, uh, again with the latest uh, of the manuscripts of these Alexandrian the text, the Nestle Allen New Testament, and then the, the Masoretic uh, Old Testament uh, text, the fifth edition. And they also consult the Septuagint for the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament as well. And like the, the HCSB, it's optimal equivalence, the blend of word for word and phrase for phrase. Um, the revision was done by 21 multi-denominational evangelical Christian scholars. Um, they, now, the main thing that's different is they changed back some of the, the names of God and some of the words. So Lord is used instead of Yahweh, where HCSB used Yahweh. Um, servant instead of slave, tongues instead of languages, uh, and they retain more of the gender-specific language. So if the passage did not, if the original text didn't include women, they did not retranslate it to reflect it in that plural way. So against the gender-neutral blend that we're going to see, that we've seen in some of the others. And again, uh, I like this diagram showing the CSB as that optimal, what they believe the optimal blend of literal uh, uh, literal translation and readability. Last translation we'll look at, the, the literal standard version was published back in February of this year, and it's a revision of the Young's literal translation that was published in 1862, realizing I did not get that in this class. I have to go back and revise that in the future. It is a formal equivalence. Uh, they claim it to be the most literal version that you can find. Again, using the, uh, a little bit different here, using the Masoretic text for the Old Testament, but the Texas Receptus and the majority text for the New Testament. Uh, and then, so it's kind of more like tr King James and the manuscripts they used, uh, but they will s consult the Septuagint uh, for the Old Testament and the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, as well. And they'll c and consulted the Alexandrian text, so the Nestle Allen text uh, uh, for the New. And they retain the use of Yahweh for the for that that most revered name of God. So, uh, again, use the backbone of the same manuscripts as the as King James, but footnoted and, and consulted the uh, the Alexandrian text uh, as well for consulting purposes. So, the literal standard version. I'm I'm really you can download this for free in different places. The eSword program that I like to use to study with, you can download it for free there, and. Uh, I look forward to reading it and comparing as I study. So that's it for the Bible translation history. And if you're deciding to, which Bible to get or which one to, which one you prefer, which one you trust, uh, all those questions are just really need prayer and, and study. 
well, things that I think you need to consider, which manuscripts are they translated from to know if it's from the Textus Receptus or from the Nestle Allen text in the New Testament and, and to know where those manuscripts, manuscripts come from. Are they a word for word? The biggest thing really is, is it a word for word or a phrase for phrase translation? And I'll, like one of the diagrams I looked at, well, what's your purpose? Are you wanting it for devotional reading to really do some hardcore studying or just use it as a supplemental help to read in conjunction with something else? Um, things, other specifics, like how does that translation translate the names of God in the text? Um, how do they translate their gender pronouns, or even their weights and measurements? Are they, do they hold to um, the original or do they try to translate them into modern terms? And, and how are their footnotes organized? That's a key thing when you're studying is to know how do the footnotes organize? Did they put the most text in the body and then footnote the the variant differences, or did they put the minimum text in the body and put the variance in the footnotes? Um, other things with the footnotes, did they tell you what manuscripts were different, or did they just say some manuscripts say, or the most reliable manuscripts say? So those are different things just to consider that I think when you're deciding which translation to read, use, and, and why. So I hope this has been helpful. And I'm sure I missed a translation or a key point, so I apologize, but hope it's helpful and gives you a broader understanding of how the Bible came from the apostles to in our hands today and what the differences between the translations are and how you can make a, a wise decision and communicate um, the history of the Bible. When someone comes to you and say, eh, they got all kinds of different Bibles for whatever kind of you want to be, which is a literally a per, had that conversation with a person. I wish I'd have known the history of what made them different and why that I could have communicated that effectively. So hope this has been helpful and just God bless you and have a, have a good time with your study.